Hello aspirants, I welcome you all to daily newspaper analysis of Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 16th of September 2024. Now let us see the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. In this first article we are going to see about the dengue fever. Then in the second article we are going to see about the change in monsoon pattern in the recent times. And in the third article we shall see about the ADB which is nothing but the Asian Development Bank. We are going to see all these articles in the prelims perspective. So without much delay let us get into the news article discussion. Now look at this article about Asian Development Bank ADB. The news is that ADB has advised Pakistan to adopt India's scheme named ULLAS. For those who don't know, this ULLAS can be expanded as the understanding of lifelong learning for all in society. So as the name itself indicates, it provides the right to education to all by giving education to even individuals who have been left out of formal education. So it is a centrally sponsored scheme where volunteers will educate the individuals who have not got any formal education. So this is what the news is about. In this backdrop, let us revise about ADB from the prelims perspective. Before that, you should know about the difference between a bank and a development bank. So in bank, what happens usually? They will accept deposits. These deposits will be given out as loans and they earn interest to it. This interest will be shared between the bank as well as whomever has deposited this money in the first place. So this is how a traditional bank works. But when we talk about development banks, these are instituted by governments itself, which means they don't accept any deposits and they give out loan only for developmental purposes and for long term projects. So this is the difference between a particular bank and a development bank. Here it is a business and when we talk about development bank, it is like providing an avenue to take loans for developmental projects. So similarly, this ADB is nothing but bank that is instituted by the countries which is in the Asia Pacific region. So it was founded in December 19, 1966 and its headquarters is in Manila, Philippines. So what is the objective of it? To foster economic growth, reduce poverty and improve quality of life in the region. So when we talk about the membership of this particular ADB, we have 68 members 48 are from Asia Pacific and 19 are from other regions and some of the key members include Japan, China, India and US. Now let us see the priority area. So the priority area will be firstly to provide inclusive economic growth. So loans will be chosen. So loans will be given to projects that bring inclusive economic growth by creating jobs and ensuring equal access to services. Second priority is to promote projects that have environment sustainability. So any projects that are relevant to climate change mitigation and renewable energy will be funded as priority. Thirdly, it focuses on providing funds to regional integration, especially among the South, especially among the Asia and Pacific region. Fourthly, it also gives priority to infrastructure development like roads, railways, ports and power stations. So these are all some of the priority areas of ADB. Now let us quickly go through the funding and operation. As I said earlier, they borrow funds from international capital market as well as they pool fund from their member countries as well. And again, they will give concessional loans to low income countries to bring development to the region. And they also provide market based loans to middle income countries. So this is very important. Remember this. And it is co-financing with World Bank and private investors. So this is about the funding and operation. Now let us quickly go through the governance structure of this ADB. So there will be a president usually from Japan. So this shows the dominance of Japan in this particular institution. So currently Masatsugu Asakawa, he is the president of ADB. Then it consists of board of governors or financial ministers from member countries and the board of directors, they take care of the day-to-day -day operation of this particular ADB bank. If you want to know about the recent initiatives, they have provided $20 billion in assistance to COVID-19 response. Secondly, they have given climate change commitment up to 75% of operations for climate action by 2030. So until this 2030 time frame, they will contribute up to $80 billion. So these are all recent initiatives with respect to ADB. Now let's quickly go through ADB projects in India. A very good example for this is Delhi to Meerut RRTS and Chennai to Kanyakumari Industrial Corridor. When we talk about the sustainable energy, they have provided funds for both solar and wind energy projects. So now we shall see about the challenges with respect to ADB. 
See, the first thing is funding limitation. We have increased development needs, but the funding is very limited. So, this is a huge challenge. And secondly, we just now saw Japan has the highest contribution to the bank. And that is why even the president is always Japan nationality. So, this shows concerns about large stakeholders' influence in the particular institution so these are all very important facts that you have to remember with respect to adb very important topic you have to revise for your prelims as well as mains and that is solve a prelims question which of the following country is not a member of asian development bank adb the correct answer for this particular question is option d brazil so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article the news is that since the monsoon season is going on the dengue fever is spreading violently in delhi and it has led to the death of two people so this is what the news article is about in this news article discussion let us revise about this dengue fever from the prelims perspective so what is this dengue fever it is a fever caused by virus named denv virus which gets transmitted through the bite of infected adis mosquito so the symptoms of the dengue includes high fever headache joint pain rashes and in severe cases it also leads to dengue hemorrhagic fever or in short called as DHF and Dengue Shock Syndrome. So how does this Dengue Fever actually spreads? Let us see them briefly. See the Dengue Fever usually spreads from a infected person through the bite of this Addis mosquito to the another healthy person. So here you might have a doubt why the female mosquitoes they alone act as a vector to spread any kind of disease. This is because only female consume blood to lay their eggs and they live a longer life than the male mosquitoes and again male mosquitoes they do not bite any person or they do not consume blood meal they live by consuming natural juice that comes from nectars and they are also short-lived when compared to the female mosquitoes so this is why the female mosquitoes are always the vector when it comes to chikungunya dengue and etc so when an infected person gets a bite of female and his mosquito the virus gets incubated inside the body of the mosquito and remains until the death of that mosquito so which means that this female mosquito becomes a carrier of the disease until the death of itself and it infects anybody which it bites so this is how the dengue fever actually gets transmitted and we saw different symptoms of this dengue virus another important thing that you have to note that is that this dengue virus actually enters into the bloodstream and they affect the blood components so what happens when they enter into the bloodstream and affect the blood components they lead to rupture of these blood components and lead to leakage of blood vessels which means blood gets leaking inside your body leading to organ failure and internal bleeding and etc so this is why this dengue fever is concerned as a very serious threat and it can easily turn into an epidemic if we don't contain the spread of these and these mosquitoes hope you got a clear picture about what is this dengue fever and all now let us see what are all the favorable conditions for the dengue to prevail see the first thing is the monsoon season so when it is waterlogged and when there is abundance of stagnant water the breeding of these female mosquitoes is enormous so this is the first favorable condition secondly urbanized area with poor sanitation and inadequate water management so whenever there is a open water source available the female and his mosquito they start to breed so we have to check on the sanitation as well as the adequate water management present in the region or not thirdly the rising temperature and the changing rainfall pattern this is actually offering a favorable condition for the dengue to prevail and again due to the growth of these and these mosquitoes so remember these facts now let us see about the government initiatives and campaigns that has been taken to contain these and these mosquitoes so first thing is the national vector borne disease control program in short called as nvbdcp so under this program all the diseases that are caused by vectors are contained through monitoring secondly the integrated vector management here this monitoring system is assisted by data profiling so when both data and monitoring gets integrated it leads to effective containing of a particular vector disease so this is what this integrated vector management actually mean thirdly we have swachh bharat mission this is to keep the area clean and contain the open defecation so it increases toilet hygiene as well as leads to waste treatment and management leading to 
better cleaner places and less availability of chances for the mosquitoes to breed now thirdly we have Ashwan Bharat health infrastructure under this particular thing vector borne diseases are given the utmost priority so these are all certain government initiatives and campaigns now let us see the prevention and control measures see the first thing is we have to wear long sleeve and we can use mosquito nets and repellents in order to get ourselves protected from a bite of mosquito secondly we have to focus on environmental management especially we have to eliminate all kind of breeding sites and we have to ensure proper per waste disposal thirdly we can use techniques like valvachia then we can use uh, biological control means or methods like using fishes like gambusia to contain or eat the mosquitoes and again when monsoon is happening due to rain frogs grow enormously but due to the climate change and increasing temperature the frogs could not survive a lot of time and the decline in frog is actually leading to the increase in mosquitoes so just look at the link between all all of these and finally we have to bring in the community awareness like we have to do regular campaigning about the disease we have to identify the symptoms and we have to provide early treatment to the population as soon as possible so these are certain prevention and control measures so so far we saw about what is this dengue fever how it gets transmitted and what are all the government initiatives we have with respect to this particular thing and then we saw about some of the prevention and measures so with this understanding Standing, let us try to solve a prelims question. This is a previous question asked in 2013. Let me read out the question for you. Which of the following disease can be transmitted from one person to another through tattooing? First thing is chikungunya, secondly hepatitis B and thirdly HIV AIDS. The correct answer here is option B, 2 and 3 only. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this article. The news is that the number of cyclones that occur in a normal monsoon has doubled in the recent times and the article cites various reasons for that. So let us see them from the prelims perspective. So what are all the reasons for this unusual cyclone? The first thing is the rise in sea surface temperature. So what happens when the sea surface temperature increases? Low pressure gets created and the air in the region gets lifted up and when they are deflected by the Coriolis force and the pressure gra gradient force. Coriolis force is nothing but the apparent force that is caused by the rotation of the earth. So when they both act upon this lifted air mass, this leads to the genesis of cyclone itself. So whenever the sea surface temperature gets increases it provides a favorable condition for the cyclone to get genesis so this is what this first reason talks about secondly the la nina phenomenon so this la nina phenomenon again favors the genesis of cyclone la nina is a condition where the peruvian coast has the high pressure and the rest of the region will have low pressure so the wind system will collecting the moisture throughout the way when it get deflected at the equator towards India and the nearby region. So what happens? This La Nina also provides a favorable condition for the cyclone to get genesis. Thirdly, the climate change. So the increasing heat trapping greenhouse gases. So when this gets increased, the total temperature of the atmosphere also gets affected right so this also leads to more frequent and intense storms now having seen the reasons for unusual cyclones now let us see about the impacts of these unusual cyclones a very good example for them is the cyclone asna and cyclone yahi among these two cyclone yahi was the most powerful storm in northeastern area causing floods and significant losses to properties and life secondly these unusual cyclones increase the intensity and frequency of flooding and damages to the infrastructure in india many states like west bengal jhar and bihar and uttar pradesh gets affected by heavy rainfall and flooding thirdly it leads to extreme weather events for example west bengal has recorded a 658 percentage record breaking rainfall in some regions and it has disrupted the daily life life and economic activity in that particular region. It also affects the connectivity, the environment as a whole, that is all the living organism within the region also gets affected. And these are all certain impacts of these unusual cyclones. So now let us quickly go through what the climate change in Indian Ocean actually leads to. 
see the climate change has actually raised the warming of indian ocean and when it is influenced by pacific ocean heat and southern ocean inflows the warming of the ocean gets enormous so this is how it gets affected in the first place secondly the warming of the indian ocean does not stops there it has a global influence by creating changing in pattern of climate around the region of indian ocean thirdly it has an impact on cyclogenesis meaning the frequency the intensity and the behavior of cyclone itself gets varied when it gets impacted by the climate change in the region so so far we saw about the reasons for unusual cyclones in the monsoon period then we saw about what are all the impacts of these changes and then we saw about how indian ocean gets affected by the climate change at the end so with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankarai's academy youtube channel now thank you so much for listening